be nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they can do they can do all this stuff and then I can just go straight for it. All right, we are ready to begin. Welcome everyone to Accuracy in America. I'm Don Irvine, and today I'm joined by an old friend of mine, uh, Paul Barker, who uh, was worked for the Montgomery County Police Force for uh, 30 years and is now living in Utah and doing lots of fun things. But I hear you, he, Paul, you're welcome to the show, and I hear you're, you're thinking about moving from Utah. <laughs> well, we just have different things. I've lived out here for now since 2010, but um, I've got still children and grandchildren in other places, actually in Hollywood, Florida. So we're thinking oh. about moving down there. Well, that'll, that'll be interesting. All right. Uh, I'm glad that you could join me today. You know, I had put out the call for someone in law enforcement, preferably retired, because then they could speak their mind <laughs> about what's going on out there. And, and I know you have some pretty strong opinions about what's been going on. So I, I want to set the stage a little bit by talking about, you know, we go back to, uh, it's not like the police have not been under attack off and on for years, you know. But now there is a very big concerted effort. You know, it started with George Floyd in Minneapolis, uh, you know, and it picked up with other incidences around the country, Rayshard Brooks in Atlanta and things like this. But, you know, I'm going to ask you first about, you know, what happened in Minneapolis. Uh, as a retired police officer, you know, what went wrong there? What, what did the Minneapolis police do that was wrong? Or, you know, or do you think they did something that was wrong? I, you know, I'm going to ask you straight out. Well, first of all, we as police officers, um, I was a training officer out on the road. So I would have brand new rookies on the street once they graduate from the academy. So we would teach them the real training on the street and it might be a little different than the academy. They were on the street and the situation occurred. They both knew each other. They both worked security together. So there was something strange about that in my opinion that, um, you know, you, I don't know much more details, but first of all, you never put your knee on somebody's neck. Um, because first of all, it could break it. Second of all, he was having trouble breathing. Um, and all my fellow uh, retired officers um, that I deal with, especially on Montgomery County Police Association, agreed that that was totally wrong and should never have done that. But one of the problems was there was, and I was hearing yesterday, that there was a police officer that was brand new on the street with there and they're trying to get the charges dropped against him because they said for example he said shouldn't we turn him to the side shouldn't we do this shouldn't we do this and the officer um, that actually had the knee on the neck kept telling him no because he was the senior officer um, and so basically the the problem was is the position where the officer was on top of him and could, the uh, person couldn't breathe. So he should have been turned to the side unless the officer had an intent to do the bodily harm, which possibly he did. Yeah, you know, there, I want you, I'm, I have you on here too, to also help me give me some insights about, you know, being on the street, being an officer, because, you know, one of my, one of my contentions, one of the problems I have with all the backlash that the police have had is that, you know, <laughs> most of us have never been in your shoes, right? We've never had to face what the officers have to face, all the different situations. You know, it, it's, it's hard to even fathom how you could be trained for everything that you see. The daily life is so, you know, you know so bizarre. It can be so strange and present you with such challenging situations that to, you know, to really to blank, to, for me to blankly criticize the police for the job that they did, uh, you know, is, is really not fair if you have never actually, you know, been on the street, have never actually faced what the police officers faced. Now, having said that, you know, with, you know, one of the reports that came out about this officer Chauvin was about, you know, he had a, you know, a multiple number of complaints against him. But, you know, the, part of my question here is that, you know, just, but just because an officer has complaints against him, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're all really legitimate, does it? No, that's true. I know, for example, I worked in, in the pedophile division and many times when I was in that division because of the 
details that we worked with going and investigating children that was molested, many of the families would try to sue us, say, well, you knew this in advance. You should have, um, you should pay attention. You should have told us in advance, you know. So I was sued at least 20 times in that division, um, but it never went forth because of the judges realized what, you know, what we were doing. Um, in this case, you never know. Um, if he has normal, um, a whole bunch of complaints, normally the problem is if he should have been let go from the, or fired from the police department, he has to go through, um, most departments have it set up where you would have to go through a trial board and that's consistent of your peers, um, higher ups like the administration chiefs and things, and then some citizens that are involved in it. Now, I don't know in that case, you know, completely what his complaints were, but if he had numerous complaints, um, probably it's the way he handled the situations and he should probably should have uh, been gone in front of their trial board and decided if he should have been released, but I don't know the details on him. Right. You know, and, and, and in one sense, maybe, you know, I'm kind of thinking out loud here is that uh, even though a lot of times we know in society, whether or not it's the police or it can be a lot of different jobs, even that complaints are filed for whatever reason, sometimes it's just to get back at the person, you know, personality conflicts, or they didn't like the way a situation was handled. But at least it might make the individual think, okay, if people are reacting this way, maybe I ought to take a look at my behavior or my conduct to see if there's something I can change a little bit to avoid those kind of things happening in the future, even if they are not wholly legitimate, right? That's true. You know, the thing is, if you, as a police officer, if you don't get any complaints and you sit back and that means he's not doing his job. <laughs> And second of all, if you're doing your job and you're dealing, depending on the type of people you're dealing with, um, for example, in Montgomery County, you never know when, on a traffic stop, if, when you make a stop on a car, if you're going to have uh, a criminal, um, uh, a, a poor citizen, a rich citizen, a diplomat, you don't know what you're stopping. Uh, until you get that person out and find the details at that time. And it's the same thing in many places. You don't know what you're dealing with. But again, these two knew each other. And it's very interesting to you know, see what happens in the court and you know what goes on. I know he was charged. And so we have to wait to see what happens in the court. Right. Now, you just said something that struck me. And because it's somewhat of a something that bothers me a lot because I really have a, I really can't understand the politicians, you know, and all these people who keep pushing this whole thing about racial profiling by the police officers. I mean, what you just said there, you know, I, I see, I hear no racial profiling of any kind. It's always has, you know, confounded me, particularly, you know, when they talk about, you know, oh, well, the police stop a disproportionate number of blacks or Latinos or whatever. But, you know, if, particularly, you know, at night, and we have, and there are plenty of cars that have, have windows are, are slightly tinted or mostly tinted. I mean, I, I don't, I never quite understood how they're supposed to know exactly who's in the car. I mean, maybe you can run the plate, but, you know, it, it, I don't think that tells you enough information anyway. So I, I think, I, I find that to be a false flag for the, for the, for the other side. Well, really. for example, I worked, most of my career was um, working in low-income housing. Um, for example, I worked in Scotland community in Potomac off Seven Lots Road. I worked in the HOC housing off Emory Grove Road. Um, so I dealt with a lot of people that were um, low-income housing and 99% of it Originally, when we, I first started working, were black, and then some. Then it changed to, you know, partially Spanish. Um, so everybody that I dealt with was either black or Spanish. There was maybe one percent that were white, 
And so when I make an arrest there on those properties, they were going to be black or Spanish they, because that's the people that live in those areas. So we were, when I worked with on Emory Grove, I was being paid by the police department, but they were being paid through the drug elimination grant. So those are the people that I dealt with. Yes, I sent a lot of black people and a lot of Spanish people to jail because of that's what, what my job was when I found a criminal activity and we were dealing with it. And you know, with the profiling is kind of a, um, not a real situation. There are some officers obviously that make everybody feel, look bad, just like that situation uh, in Minneapolis. But, you know, profiling is, I guess some officers might just look for a certain race, but when you're dealing with certain community and that's your assignment and you're assigned to a beat or an area, that might be the total type of people that you're dealing with. Right. Uh, you know, one of the things about this, the Rayshard Brooks thing that, that happened down in Atlanta that uh, piqued my curiosity, and I'd like to get a little bit of insight from you if I can, is that, uh, you know, the, Brooks, as he was, you know, he wasn't being very cooperative at all with the, with the officers. Uh, but then he also apparently, I guess, grabbed the officer's taser and tried to shoot it back at him or something. And there was some art, there was some discussion about whether or not the taser actually had a charge or whatever and was useless anyway and that they, the officer shouldn't have fired on him to begin with. But you know, I, I also just saw a story the other day where the, the, own, the inventor of the taser is looking to create kind of a line. He, he wants to do something with the tasers that he would, you know, his vision would be is that officers would, I guess, be equipped with tasers only and not necessarily uh, service revolvers and other weapons like that. I mean, from your experience in the police force, I mean, is this even, is this something doable? I mean, what's the deal with the tasers? I mean, I know the tasers give quite a dull, you know, uh, jolt of electricity, but, you know, it, to me, it's still a lethal weapon. If, if, if somebody's pointing that at me, I don't know what the heck's going on. I'm going to react. Okay, a taser, if you're not familiar, has a cartridge on it. And once you pull the trigger, the cartridge shoots out. He would, the officer would not be carrying the taser on him if it wasn't prepared to be used. When he pointed that taser at the officer, the officer has a right to shoot and kill because that's a deadly weapon. I've seen people, and no matter what people say, I've seen uh, two types of people. One that the taser works really well against, and I've seen people that tasers don't work. So in this case, when he turned around and pointed the taser at the officer, the officer had a right to protect himself because he <coughs> could have been tased with that taser and two prongs with wires shoot out and hit your body. And then if he pulled the trigger at that point, he, he would large, you know, a great sum of electricity would go through your body and he would be handicapped at that time. And, so, and it's, it's a one-time use, right? I mean, you have to read, you well, know. there's two, the cartridge goes out. Now you can take the cartridge off and put the taser to the body and it would still work. Okay. So there's right. two, there's two ways of using it. Like if you're on top of somebody on the ground and he's fighting and you tell everybody to move back and you take your taser because you take your cartridge off and you point and you hit, touch it to the body, he's going to get shocked that way too. Is there, is there as much electricity at that point in time, much of a charge as yeah, it was in the, the cartridge? Same amount of electricity. Okay. All right. That's interesting. What happens, the electricity from the cartridge comes from the actual weapon. Okay. That makes and sense to it, me. It shocks the body at that point. Okay. That makes sense to me. So one of the, you know, one of the other things too, I want to talk about, uh, and this is kind of a broad, so, so we have, you know, this huge now defund the police movement. And I, you know, we're, we're seeing this really take root across the country. Like I haven't seen it, you know, take place before we had New York city is going to cut, you know, a, like a billion or up to a billion and a half dollars 
out of the police budget. And as I was reading about some of these things too, it's, you know, I mean, not does this, not, you know, does affect the, I mean, they're not the academy. I guess the, the, the cadet classes are being cut for one or two years or something like that as a result of that. This year's class is not going to happen. But there's also units, there's a unit that deals with high crime areas that's being disbanded or something like that. The lot of, you know, lots of different things are going into this funding. And, and for, I don't, I don't understand what, how these politicians, you know, the lay people I understand because a lot, you know, lay people are kind of just, they're clueless. But the politicians should have a little bit more forethought and a little more intelligence that, you know, if you're in Minneapolis, and you want to, you're going to defund the police and you're going to maybe try to dismantle the police force. And you want to have these community relations people handle these things. It's like, this is a recipe for disaster. And, and we're already seeing a problem, I think, you know, New York. I mean, summertime is never a good time for crime in these inner cities. And it's exploded now. And I think, I, I think you know, the Black Lives Matter movement, I think that all of these things have been going on, have helped foster this a little bit more where people are thinking like, well, you know, maybe the police force isn't going to enforce some of the laws as much as they did before because of all these other interactions, they want to pull back a little bit because who knows how that'll blow back in their face, all these kinds of things. I mean, you know, where do you see all of this, Paul? Well, you know, it's, it's crazy. I, I was reading something yesterday. Montgomery County government is actually, the executive is, county exec is requested so much funds take it away and they want to cut, I think it was six to eight um, resource officers from the schools. And then they want to cut like 10 or 15 positions um, out of the police department that they're, they're paying now. Uh, all I see is that the world, it's going to become a disaster everywhere where if they lack of police, lack of equipment, you, you know, situations where you're investigating, where you need to have overtime to pay for uh, situations that we dealt with. Uh, you know, in New York City, they, they're already saying that crime has gone higher because they've cut some of the, um, or the, the groups that investigate, you know, different crimes. Um, I, I just see that we're going to become a disaster and it's just like the way communism is because they want, they'll have to have the government um, take care of the cities and then it, nobody's going to have an open, you know, ability to, um, to decide, you know, what's right and wrong. And then there, there won't be police. I just can't see all these stupid things that they're trying to do to cut the police force back. We're always yeah. short people, we're short hours, um, and then this is not gonna help at all. Yeah, I mean, you know, this is coming, this comes at a time too where, I mean, you know, generally politicians, I mean, you know, most of the local city councils and whatever, they have been decent, you know, in most cases about trying to find more money for, for police forces where, where possible without having to overtax the population. I mean, there's always, you know, police and education are always very big, you know, high on the agenda or have been, but this, you know, the police have now become like the dirty word. And so it's without, with really out any forethought and thinking about what's going to happen, what the end result will be is that, oh yeah, you know, politics now say the political winds say, we need to defund the police, so we'll do that. But they have really no idea what they're leading themselves into. You know, to me, also, laws are very complex. You know, they, they, there's, there's a ton of laws on the books, no matter where you go. Are we, really, are we expected to, uh, you know, not just with smaller police forces, or, but with minimal police presence, if not just the community, try to interpret these things as you talk about, you know, what's right, what's wrong. Uh, you know, I always look at the police as like, okay, look, they know, you know, they've been trained, they know the law, they can tell me, they'll interpret, they'll tell me, what have I done right and what have I done wrong here so I can correct my path and make sure I stay on the right side of things. Uh, I just, you know, I just see this arbitrary uh, decision making coming up now in terms of like, well, now it's going to go into this gray area where somebody who hasn't been trained in diddly squat now has been given the power to decide these things. And as you said, this is disaster. You know, you just mentioned these resource officers. This is also another thing, you know, that is being, has become a big political football is the police presence in schools, okay? Now, 
I don't know. Did you? I I didn't ask you for your background. Did you? Where Where were you originally from? Pardon me. Say it again. Where were you originally from? Where were you born and raised? I was born in um, Maryland. Okay, so you're Washington, so. DC. Yeah, all right, Washington. so so you're you're a Maryland native, and I was born in D.C. but basically raised in Maryland. <laughs> so I went I went to Montgomery County Schools. My kids went to Montgomery County Schools, but you know when I was going to Montgomery County Schools. There were no police resource officers back then. That's back in the 70s, you know. And, and you know, and you know, by the time my kids got to schools, that became that was very much a part of the norm. Now I didn't think anything of it. I thought this was actually good because not all schools, you know, I mean it's like you pull the resource, you pull that resource officer out, and I'm thinking like, exactly what's going to happen in that school? Uh, you know, I, crazy. yeah, I you mean know, I work. Um, as a reason, well, we, we called them educational facility officers in Montgomery County. I worked at Gatesburg High School. I think I made more arrests in the school system than I did on the street many times. <laughs> um, when I retired, uh, I was planning to move and sell my house here, you know, actually in Maryland. And because I bought a house in Utah and still have the house in Maryland, I ended up working security for Montgomery County Public Schools. And I was assigned to Kennedy, Blair, and then Einstein. And if you <laughs> hey, know- That's a trifecta. <laughs> yeah. So schools were great. The administration were great. And they supported us. When I was at Gaithersburg High School, the principal and the administration used my knowledge to support them in making decisions. Nowadays, it seems like principals don't ask the, um, the resource officers to be part of the decision, what should be happening when things occur. Um, if we cut all this budget, you're not only gonna do, you're gonna cut the academy, which you'll cut it shorter, um, you won't get all the training in the background on things. Um, you're going to end up getting um, not the way the system works where we get cars from different companies like Ford and Chrysler. Uh, Ford just gave a whole bunch of money to support defunding the police. Um, it's hard to believe. Um, but all these companies that they're cutting out all these TV shows that have to do with police. Um, it's, it, it's, it's, it's a real hell out there for a police officer to be on the street and have to do the right thing, but at the same time, know that he could be killed or fired at the time. It's just crazy. Yeah, you know, you mentioned the police shows. I mean, you know, when, when that idea was brought up, I, I kind of scratched my head a little bit because I thought, well, you know, it's not, I've watched a lot of police shows in my lifetime, you know, I mean, going back into the 70s and, you know, in the current ones, which are, you know, like anything that Dick Wolf does, it's basically ripped from the headlines and, it, and they tend to be, all his shows tend to be very gritty and, you know, and things like that. Do all the shows, you know, it, I guess part of it is that huh, these people who are protesting these, these things, they, part of it, I think, is that they're like, well, all these police shows, you know, the reason they're on is that because they glorify the police and police work. But, you know, I don't see that in a lot of police shows. I think there's a, I think there's a element of realism where it's like, look, we see the good and the bad, you know, it's not all like it's, it's great to do this. Um, uh, and, and some, you know, sometimes that part makes me cringe, but it's like, look, if, if they're trying to be somewhat honest in Hollywood, which is always a question mark, then you have to kind of show both sides of the equation in terms of this. You know, not, not everyone on the police force is going to be 100% lowly pure, but that's the way life is. We are, you know, we, in any profession, you, not everybody is 100% trustworthy for whatever reason. So, yeah, show the good and the bad. But cutting out cutting out the cop shows just seems like kind of ridiculous. Like so, one of our family's favorite is you know Blue Bloods. Uh, you know mm -hmm. it's you know and it's, we we and we find that to be a really fascinating show. It shows lots of different aspects of police on the streets, the detectives, you know, the police commissioner, the whole, you know the whole, all the dynamics in there uh, that go on in there. It's not always pretty. Uh, you know the DA, all the all the interrelationships in there. Uh, but it, to us, it just seems like 
that's a pretty good glimpse of lots of facets of police life from from the street cop all the way up to the PC's office yeah. uh, and the challenges that, that are there, uh, you know, and I can't say that, I can't say it's going to be, you know, I can't put it on necessarily the spectrum of conservative versus liberal. It probably leans more conservative. And there's, you know, the family aspect of the, of the Reagan family of all, of the great name, right? Of sitting yeah. around the table saying grace and talking about things that still, that still strikes me as an oddity in Hollywood that they allow that family dynamic to even occur on that on television. I agree. You know, yeah. my favorite show at all times, I think was originally called homicide on the street, which took place in Baltimore. That was a great show. That Andre, Andre Bauer police show. I think that, that was gritty and boy, I mean, yeah. Homicide life on the streets, I think yeah. was the, right. Yeah. yeah. Andre Brower is fabulous and they had a great cast. <laughs> And it was more real than I think most shows are. <clears throat> so, but and I think and I think that's what made it made it successful for its run is that it was I think people understood people particularly if they were familiar with inner city you know and what happens is like yeah no this this was very real to a lot of people so yeah that's so great. there are you know there are good things you know one of the other th one of the things about the resource officers and the police I mean you talk about the budget I mean definitely definitely you know something that gets attacked on the budget line now is, you know, pull them out. Because I think part of the thinking is, you know, or the mantra of these is like, you know, police officers in schools, bad idea, you know, it's like, because all they're going to, they're going to be looking to do, you know, to, for the bad elements in there, and they're going to be trying to arrest people, they, they're going to be overzealous and whatnot. But I, I would think that the police officers are there, I mean, partially to keep the peace, but also to be, you know, someone that the, that the students can get to know and understand and grow to respect, hopefully, along the way. And they, as they said, they're a resource to the, to the uh, administration. The problem, I think, as you mentioned, I think it, you know, it's been expanded over the last you know, 10, 15 years, is that teachers, administrators, are, are now becoming more fearful of the students. These are people that are, you know, the teachers and the administrators, they're in charge of these schools. They set the tone, they set, you know, they have the curriculum, they need to lay out what the school, the basic rules are or behavior and conduct and all of these things. And now it seems that the power base has been shifting over time to the students because, you know, all they need is one complaint to me, you know, about, oh, this is, somebody did this, they said this or they did this. And it seems to put this, it seems to put the administration back on its heels. It's like, who's running the store here? Who's minding this thing, right? Yeah, you know, I, as a, as a police officer in the school, I had respect from the students. I would get uh, students coming to me to give me information where they were having problems in life, girls that were abused or raped, things like that. They would come to me because I was their friend in the school. Yes, I was tough, but I was at the same time, I was their friend. I would go in, try to go in and do some classes in the school and participate in programs. I was always involved in programs um, that the school had. Um, for example, when they would have assemblies, we would be there um, for, you know, just being part of it, enjoying it. But at the same time, we're there for security purposes. Uh, we've had, you know, and it worked really well. Um, but at the same time, you know, like you said, the the administration have been told here in Montgomery County, well, in Montgomery County, I'm not here, <laughs> in Montgomery County, they, they've they been told that you shouldn't have all these arrests happening in the school because then it makes you look bad and makes Montgomery County look bad. It's just like years ago, they said that we, the county government said, we don't have a gang problem. And we're number two in the nation for MS-13. We have more MS-13 than any other state except California. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, what you just said there is interesting too, because it's, in, you know, I experienced not on a, not on a uh, police level or anything like this, but back in, I think it was 1976, I got one of the, uh, the prize positions to be a summer school driver's ed aide. 
Okay, mm -hmm. when they were still doing driver's ed in the schools. Yeah. And, and we had the driver. I was, I was, I went to Northwood High School. I applied for that. There, we must have had like 50 kids. And I think there are five of us that got selected. You know, and it, it pays to know people. I had gotten involved in the athletic department and I knew that, and the athletic director was the guy making the choices. So he chose me. So, you know, favoritism, I'm all for it. You know, that was okay for me. That was a nice little minimum, pay, you know, minimum wage paying job over the summer. But, one of the things that struck me about that summer was that we had a kid in there who had been, he had failed the course multiple times. And so he was back for the summer session. He was horrible. He could not drive. I mean, this is a kid that should not get a license. There was just no way. And, and so, you know, recommendation was, is that to fail him again. But th there, was the, there was one problem. I don't even know whatever happened in the end. I wasn't part of the final process, obviously. But the discussion among the, 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 the teachers that were in charge were said, he says, the thing here is, is that if we fail him, the county is going to come back to us and ask us why, because we get, the county gets $65 yeah. from the state for every student they pass for driver's yeah. ed. You know, it's like, wait a minute, we're talking about $65 over putting a kid on the streets who can't drive and could, could, could cost Kill somebody people. a life or a limb? Yeah. I mean, it's insane. I mean, this was 1976. <laughs> so I guess I'm glad that there are now official drivers and, you know, it's switched completely off of that whole thing. But it's, you know, it's just, it's, it's crazy to see what, how, how the political process and money and other things drives these forces. Now, I do, I am curious though, you, you've been in Utah for 10 years. Uh, I know you have a stepdaughter, is it? That's correct. Okay. I mean, have you been able to observe, you know, what's going on in the Utah schools? I mean, do they have resource officers in the Utah schools? Do they need they them? They have part-time, um, for example, Provo would have a part-time uh, officer at Tim Few and in Provo High School. Um, but I was shocked when I first moved here. I went to a football game and at Mon in Montgomery County, we would have overtime paid officers, you know, officers on uh, special detail we would have seven to eight officers at a football game i went to a football game here my very first week um here uh with my daughter in 2010 um i guess it would have been 2010 um and one officer for like 2,000 people <laughs> it, it was totally different but now they're they're tr building the for example I was in charge, I worked at Provost Elementary School and uh, I was in charge of security and I was in charge of the, uh, they were rebuilding the building so they had need somebody to be in, oversee the traffic control for the parents in the parking lots. And I had teachers and people that worked under me. But now they're building the schools, for example, they built Provost so when you come in the front door, you have it goes into the office, so that it's not you're not going into the main area of the schools. Um, but it, the difference is in Maryland, in Montgomery County, we would be we would the resource officer would have uh, numerous elementary schools and at least one or two junior highs. Like I had two junior highs over there in Gatesburg, and then the high school. Here, they only have resource officers part-time in the high school system. Um, so I, I see that, you know, I work a lot with them. I'm, so, but I I see that they're in, crime is not there where it is in Maryland, for example, but it's eventually going to get here. And that's, you know, they're trying to make things secure the principal that worked with me at Provost Elementary School is now in charge of security for all um, Provost School District. And he's trying to change the behavior and um, make it more secure for all the schools in Provost, which it's pro in the you know, I'm sure, but a lot of people don't, that Provost has their own school district. And then like Orem and Amer American Fork and all them are under a different school district and then in Spanish Fork and that area is all, uh, well, they're one area, one school district too, so. 
Yeah, you know, I mean, one of the, one of the challenges for Utah, because we were talking before we started the show about, you know, how, how expensive Utah is getting for homes, uh, just, the, just the phenomenal growth of Utah. I mean, there's plenty of articles in the Deseret News and places about the phenomenal growth of small towns that have exploded, uh, you know, da dairy farms that are disappearing. All, you know, the old way of life in Utah is fast disappearing. Uh, I remember... I remember my late uncle when he uh, had moved up to uh, uh, up to the Logan area, north of Logan, up to the Cove area. I can't remember the name of his town. His son lived in Cove. It was north of Logan, but anyway, it was a small town, yeah. very nice. And but you know, he said, he said there used to be a time, you know, when we didn't have to lock our doors, but it's you know we have to lock our doors. And part of it has been this explosive growth because it's not all uh, organic growth of Utah because with the kids, you know, people having lots of children. There's a lot of people coming in from the West Coast that have sold their expensive mm -hmm. homes. There's a good, pretty good tech business, tech uh, growth corridor in Utah as well. And that attracts a lot of people from the outside and, and jobs and things like that. So the Utah dynamic has changed in terms of the population setting, which also I think this is, you know, the this Utah schools are going to have to, you know, they're going to have to keep a very careful eye, in my opinion, about what's happening because while there, while there was, you know, very little crime compared to Montgomery County, uh, the demographics are going to change where that is going to start ticking upwards and they're going to need those resource officers or some, right. kind, of, some kind of security to handle that because it may, be, it may be still somewhat peaceful now, but the way Utah is growing, it will not stay that way forever. That's true. And the thing is, you look at a lot of companies move here because they like the weather and the environment. Um, and then, so there's a lot of the families that originally moved here for the companies are permanently living here. Um, you're getting a lot of uh, Argentinian, um, Peruvian, um, Guatemalan, Honduran. You're getting a lot of people, a lot of Latin American and South American people moving here. Um, and the idea that this whole area was Mormon country is changing a lot because other people were there. Uh, other religions are coming in from, especially the Latin American and South American countries. Um, and it's obviously mostly Mexican in this area, but it is, um, the whole area is changing and they're trying, you know, I think change and watch out what's going on. And, and I think it's important. That yeah, I mean, I mean, I don't have any problem with change, but you have to be able to manage the growth and handle right. all these different things. And there are so many facets to this, you know, that have to deal with this. I mean, the, the growth is how, how many more areas do you do you build in and, and whatnot? I mean, uh, when I was out, when I was out in Utah at the end of, for about the, yeah, right, right, right on Memorial Day, when after my father-in-law had passed away, um, mm -hmm. I, we took a, we went to go visit, uh, my cousin's uh, daughter, who we hadn't seen in, in a number of years, and she had moved from Lehigh to Grantsville. So it was a little, you know, it was a little bit of a drive, but we were we were staying in Lehigh anyway, mm -hmm. so that you know, that shortened the drive a little bit. But I'm driving up there, and I'm like, what the heck is out here? And yeah. you know, and, but it's growing. It's go, you know, it's growing like crazy. My her her husband uh, works for the for UDOT. So, and, and right now everybody's working from home anyway, so he has really no commute, but yeah. you know, he, he, he took that job. He says, I could still have the job. The commute wasn't really all that bad for him one way or the other. And the cost of, you know, was he could afford a bigger house uh, out there. But I'm just like, I'm like, it's like, okay, what, what happens when I come back in another year? It's going to be yeah. completely different. It's just like I said, and you know, it used to be all those small towns outside Salt Lake would be classified Salt Lake. Now it's towns all the way from, you know, for example, south, south going south to Provo. There's towns all the way down, um, and you go north. There's it's crazy too. Same air type of things, and up in Logan, so it's growing, and that means the type of people also good and bad. And the criminals are moving here too. <laughs> yeah, it used right, to be that this. gangs would find. Um, I know, for example, you know, from being experienced, I worked in a gang in, a gang unit for Montgomery County, and that we found out that some the blood had moved up near Frederick in the country area 
to be there and they would bring, that's where they would, because it was quiet, nobody else were around and they could do what they want. Um, but, you know, we, um, gangs are still around here too. And it's growing to the point, you know, the police have to make a big difference. Um, just the other day, they had a protest going down on University Avenue and somebody was shot in a car to try to break through where the crowd was stopping cars and somebody pulled out a gun and shot somebody and it was the you know first time in a long time something like that happened but it's happening because the community is changing yeah you know this just strikes me i want one final question here before we kind of close up is which wasn't on my mind you know before my my, my agenda here for this but how what about you know there's been sporadic incidences of where people have <laughs> entered churches in different parts of the country with guns and shot and killed people um i don't i don't know of anything of like that happening in utah uh and utah has a very you know heavy obviously you know mormon latter-day saint population mm -hmm. but i mean you know do you see a, a point in time where there will be, you know, more churches uh, will start to have some kind of security officer there, or there'll be something there to screen people coming in just to potentially prevent this violence? Or yeah, is this something I, long? I, I think so. For example, um, I forgot what state it was where a retired FBI agent stopped the gunman that came in and shot him. Um, I, I personally, my opinion is we, you know, uh, I'm going to say <laughs> the church doesn't allow you to carry a handgun in church um, unless you are a police officer. And uh, I think that's a big problem. They should have a setup. So, for example, like myself, a retired officer, I work as an F, I work for a company called ISN, which is an, um, works, does all the tobacco inspections with kids for private, you know, for food FDA. Um, I carry my gun. Um, I should be allowed to <laughs> carry there for protection of our ward for local people. Um, I don't think normal citizens should carry, right. but I think that people that are qualified and certified should be able to carry. I think there will be someday that they might have to have security and work on it. My my suggestion is that a retired officer or um, an, a federal officer should be able to work with the local bishop or the lo local leader of their congregation and create a security plan and be able to, in case something does happen. I think that's an excellent idea, Paul, because you know right now, uh, I, all churches are try are struggling trying to figure out what to do about COVID and how to really gather safely together again, right? Mm -hmm. And to me, in a way, this also presents an opportunity to think about security planning because most churches have multiple points of entry, uh, you know, and that's the way they were designed. I mean, it's a community. You walk in, you right. walk out, whatever. You you partake of of the services there and feel the spirit, that type of a thing. But COVID you know, is changing the whole dynamic of that because you can't have people coming in at six different entrances uh, under this scenario, or or at least, you know, how you how are you going to temperature check them or how do you, you know, do this? And this person, to me, seems like an opportunity to say, well, you know, if we're going to talk about this, let's think about security while we're at it. You know, we don't have to start to implement the security feature right away, but we can begin the planning process. And you know, most areas are wide enough. I mean, whether or not it's the, you know, whether or not it's, it's the, you know, the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints or the Episcopal Church or the Baptist Church or the Catholic Church, they are lar they're usually large enough congregations out there that probably have at least one person somewhere that is either current or retired law enforcement mm -hmm. that has, you know, that can carry a weapon. And they would be the, they would be the excellent resource to become that, be the head of that planning committee and help mm -hmm. the other people understand what needs to be done. Because I, I, as much as I want to be an optimist about things in the world, I think the realistic stand, you know, point of view is that 
there are things that are happening in this world uh, and that we need to be pre better prepared for it because we don't know. To, you know you, it's better to be prepared for an incident that may never happen than to not be prepared and to let that happen and then tragedy strikes. I actually just, <laughs> this is a touchy point for me. I actually sent a letter to the first presidency and said, oh. <laughs> give me that exact same scenario. <laughs> Suggesting that we create that the, like you said, retired officer or local officer that is still qualified to carry to work with the bishop and the state presidency to be able to um, create a security plan. I am actually the head of security for the Provo, Utah State, and I have about 10 people that work under security under me. And we meet whenever before every state conference or whenever a general authority is in the area, but I'm not allowed to carry my handgun, um, which is kind of silly, my opinion. But um, again, that's exactly what I. <laughs> and I. How did I know we were going to be on the same wavelength? <laughs> And then you've got to make a decision. Are you going to follow what the church says or are you going to protect yourself and wear a gun? Right. Uh, those, are, those, are, those are all very tricky, you know, very you know, yeah. hard decisions. All right. So finally, just, uh, just final thoughts for me. I mean, in terms of you know, advice or a statement or whatever, in terms of, you know, where, what should we do? What do we do about this defund the police movement? How do we how do we better you know defend the police and help support our our our, our first responders? You know our our law enforcement officers. I mean, what's your advice? My opinion is at this point, I think a couple things can be done. Um, first of all, show your support for your local police wherever they're at by bringing food to the police station and telling them thank you um, whenever you, in, especially then second, whenever you see a police officer, um, talk to them and support them by waving at them or let your children know that they're the good people because they're getting the opposite. You know, tell them, I think by more people going to their governments, their county governments, their city governments, and complaining about what these people are trying to do to cut the funds of the police, it actually is gonna hurt us as citizens and that we need to speak up and speak out to the world and let people know. Um, because if they take all that equipment, you know, the money's not gonna be there so they can't run their special equipment there are uniforms, there are all, everything that we need all the time as police officers. I think right. just by supporting them. Yeah, way. no, I mean, yeah, I mean, I was, I was part of the Montgomery County Republican you know, Central Committee where we had one of our, our people who wanted to uh, do something for the, for the police in Montgomery County. We had to, you know, we couldn't raise them. We couldn't raise the money through the party itself, that because that's basically not allowed to be able to do to put a donation mm -hmm. towards that. So we did it as a you know we sponsored it, but without money. But we basically had people put money in and give it directly to the person coordinating it. So it just by you know it didn't go through any political <laughs> channels whatsoever, and it was a lot of fun. We did you know we had a handful of people show up. We we went into the Germantown station up there and uh, delivered uh, Krispy Kreme donuts and some coffee and some things like that and uh it was it was a lot of fun you know and and talked with the officers a little bit took a few pictures uh did some uh you probably saw, you may have even seen the pictures on facebook you know we had some posters and did a little sign waving out front for a little while uh but you know more of that is needed unfortunately we're just not seeing a whole lot of that it's it's a lot of the uh <clears throat> the other side you know kind of messages about the police force so i think you know, with all this, we, we, we need to kind of, you know, really double, redouble our efforts on this here and elsewhere. Yeah, I would also say we need to, uh, the citizens need to look at who they're re representing, who they have representing them in their, like the county government, city government. Right now in right. County Council in Montgomery County, there's numerous people that are anti-police and you know, we need to get that changed. But 
you know, if the community doesn't speak up and say something or choose the right people, you're always going to have this problem. That's right. All right. Well, I think we'll end it there. This this was a great, I, I enjoyed the discussion, Paul. I didn't thank know you. how long we would spend, but I really loved every minute of it. It was good to see you again. And thank uh -huh. you so much for taking your time to do this uh, and giving us, giving me your insight uh, in terms of this, because we've never actually really talked about your your job as a police officer before. So it was, it was fabulous and fascinating. And I just <laughs> really, really appreciate it. And uh, you're a great example and a great friend uh, thank to you. everyone out there. Well, All same right. here. So everyone out there, thank you for joining us today. Please stay safe, stay well. Remember, we live in the greatest country in the world. Do not let anybody tell you otherwise. And then God bless America, and I will see you tomorrow. That's it.